In a busy workshop that specialized in large history paintings, assistants, under the master's supervision, would usually prepare the dead coloring, working from the master's compositional and reference sketches. The master would oversee the workup, making any changes or corrections, and the finishing itself was almost always carried out by the master's own hand. Why was this so? Well, finishing was a highly concentrated and disciplined process gained by confidence, maturity, and dexterity. It required an expert understanding of achieving particular visual effects through brushwork, color, lights and shades, including the crowning achievement of glowing flesh tones based on a thorough understanding of anatomy. Any mistakes at this stage of the painting were unforgiving and noticeable, which is why Leonardo da Vinci advised, and I quote, I remind you, painter, that if you discover some error in your work, either through your own judgment or through the respected advice of another, you should correct it so that when you show the work publicly, you will not show your shameful weakness at the same time. For a painting does not die at its birth, but bears witness to your ignorance for a long time. Finishing consisted of precise touches regarding detail work, of convincing surface visual perceptibilities, and of facial expressions and hand gestures, all of which required variable paint handling techniques, acquired only through experience and individual expression. And since more intense and usually more expensive pigments were applied at this painting stage, the master artist would not allow a beginning student to accomplish this task. The finishing process was not for the faint-hearted or the incompetent. Upon close examination, an ideal finished painting in the 1600s revealed all the layers of the three-step painting process and never ever was to appear overworked or have an exacting impression. All the various paint layers were to set off from each other. In other words, the toned ground of the support was to sparkle through with hints of both the dead coloring and second coloring stages being visible throughout the entire painting. This was to give a sense of clever ease and spontaneity by the painter to purposely delight and surprise the eye of the viewer that the achieved lifelike realness was nothing but skillfully applied paint. Here is a painting comparison between an unfinished figure and dog with a finished example. Both these works were executed in the coloretto approach by the Spanish painter Diego Velazquez. The one to the left is between its dead color and second coloring stages. Note the execution of the vague background, purposed first to set off the dwarf and the dog. Second coloring has been applied in the blue-gray wall and sand-colored floor with translucent layers of paint. The man's hair and boots are in the dead color stage since no color or textured brushwork has yet been applied. The black dog is also in the dead color stage. Note the undetermined bare area across the dog's neck and the flat application of the dog's body in black and white. Second coloring, or the workup layer, is noted in the patches of white in the hat, in the collar, and sleeve ruffles all executed in thickly painted brushwork expressing immediate surface perceptibilities. The gold touches on the costume, sleeve, and even the undefined red blob on the shoulder were also executed in the second coloring since there is an apparent thicker application of paint and color. Lights and shades on the dwarf and the dog are not yet synchronized or appropriately harmonized which is achieved during the finishing, as is more evident in the polished painting on the right of the cardinal. His face is smoother, given the final emotional touches of expression. 
his sleeve, gloves, and rifle have more detail and definition. The painting shows both the figure and the dog sharing the same source of light and shadows. The loosely painted, translucent layer landscape appears incomplete, but perhaps it is not. As was his typical painting approach, Velazquez would first finish the figures and animals in a portrait, and then lastly, complete the landscape in a subordinate manner, almost creating the effect of a theatrical backdrop. Closer examination reveals that no muscles are indicated on the flat body color of the black dog. There is no distinction in its ears, eyes, or face expression. A drawn outline can be seen in its legs, chest, and neck, to include a bold mark on the top of its head slashing through the wet white paint. The entire black dog is in the dead color stage when compared to the finished brown dog. Note in this dog that its paws are distinct, complete with nails. Cast shadows are applied as seen behind the dog's ear and elbow to increase the sense of depth. And the contour edges, especially along the dog's shadowed back, are blended into the background to increase the sense of roundness as opposed to the drawn outlines evident in the black dog. The Flemish painter Peter Paul Rubens would describe both the second coloring and the finishing stage of a painting in this manner, and I quote, In regards to the lights, in them the colors may be loaded as much as may be enough required. They have substance. It is necessary, however, to keep them pure. This is effected by laying each tint in its place and the various tints next to each other, so that, by a slight blending with the brush, they may be softened by passing one into another without stirring them much. Afterwards, you may return to this preparation and give it those decisive touches which are always the distinctive marks of great masters. We conclude this 10-chapter lecture presentation of the making of 16th and 17th century European art masterpieces with close-up images of finished paintings. Observe the three-step painting process in each picture. However, realize that by only viewing the originals themselves in well-preserved condition, one can truly appreciate the visual textural beauty, realism, and painterly depth of 16th and 17th century paintings. Also notice the wonderful free command variety of individual styles of preferred execution, that is, the painter's unique painterly manner, whether in the rough or smooth approach or both. Thank you for watching.